Um, thanks for everyone for coming today. Uh, it's the, I think the first design meetup in Meta London. Uh, we are doing it together with my friend Sil. Where? But, oh, but, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, she's she's an amazing host. We've done uh, lots of meetups with uh, Sil uh, before on Framer. Maybe people know on Sketch, Figma, uh, in different countries, not just in London. Uh, and uh, yeah, so I'm. My name is Sergey. Uh, I work at Meta right now at the Reality Labs department, uh, and we are hiring a bunch of design roles. Some of them with cool kids like me in Reality Labs. Uh, some of them with cool kids in enterprise products in monetization. With cool kids in WhatsApp. Uh, they are also hiring for design system role. I guess there will be some heads up later on. Sorry, you know, I need to say something while I'm on stage. It's like, I don't have slides. So yeah, so like pop, pop things here. Like um, if you think you're, you know, you like working at Meta, you have a nice portfolio, you can find me on LinkedIn. You can send me portfolio and we can maybe figure out their, you know, the referral stuff. I can get a bonus you know, enjoy the sunshine somewhere in Spain. So like, you know what to do. Um, yeah, housekeeping information. So when you need to go to the toilet, it's there to the right. Uh, there's big button near the door, press that to open the door. When you're trying to come in, press the button to open the door when you're trying to come in. Uh, pizza will come after seven. I know it can be a bit of disappointing start with the event that is like first you have beer then talks and then pizza but that's that's how we try to figure things out because we have around 1000 people right now in the zoom yeah yeah it's, it's coming so yeah so they want to start as well i guess they can have pizza right now while they're like watching at home so they are more fortunate but yeah let's kick off and i will pass to my friend seal yeah, thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you so much, Sergei, for doing this meetup with me. Sergei is very famous for his uh, meetups he did in London. So I guess many people came to see his comeback. <laughs> Hopefully he will do more meetups. But hello, everybody. Welcome. Thank you so much for coming. Welcome to Into Design Systems. Um, before we start, uh, quick look at the agenda so we do some welcome introduction and then we will have our two amazing speakers Christos and Marianne talking about of course design systems then there will be some some networking pizza and drinks and by the way hi I'm Syl I'm the founder of Into Design Systems um, community and conference and also I brought my fancy Meta glasses, smart glasses with me to take a photo of you, if that's okay for you. If not, let me know afterwards and I will ask AI to replace your face with somebody else. I think that should be fine. So if you can also raise your hand, maybe we can test if AI can do five fingers or something. <laughs> so are you ready? Hey Meta, take a photo. Just a second. Hey Meta, take a photo. Nice. Yeah, that's it. I took a photo. <laughs> awesome. So with me, I also have my wonderful co-host, Andresa. She's helping me with the meetups. Somehow we met online and we ended up doing meetups worldwide together. So I don't know how that happened. Please welcome Andresa. So... Andresa, you can take this microphone, but is it okay if I take some more pictures of you or is it creepy, no, with my glasses? <laughs> okay. Like this? Perfect. Okay, let's go. I'm not going to be using that one. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Andresa. You can find me on LinkedIn and Instagram as Andresa Lombardo. Um, I prepped three quick facts about me to share today. So um, the number 10 is there because 
2010 was the year that I visited London for the first time. Very relevant. And it's also the year um, in which I started my career in design, which gives away that I'm, in fact, a millennial. Um, I'm also I'm based in Ireland. I'm based in Dublin. And the number 17 is there because just a few days ago, I got a new tattoo. Um, there's one over here. And that's my tattoo number 17. Um, for my first tattoo, I actually got when I was 12 years old. Not sure how I pulled that off. My, my mom authorized it. Um, yeah, I'm not, not sure. Um, I'm a huge design systems enthusiast and nerd. Um, I work as a principal systems designer at teamwork.com and I teach as well design systems with Memorizely, which you may recognize from super fast. <laughs> um, um, you may have Xander here, super fast himself. <laughs> um, I'm incredibly lucky to host the design systems um, meetups and conference with Sale. Um, but I also use this meetups as an audition for my position as a speaker next time. So for now, a host, but maybe a speaker in the future. Um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> and the very, very, very odd time um, content creator. So maybe you see some of my videos on the Memorizely um, socials. But yeah, very odd. Not a consistent content creator. Um, one last thing that I wanted to share before um, you we introduce our amazing speakers. Um, if you've attended the Inter Design Systems Conference last year, you would have seen this. Um, Sil and I looking very serious, very proper, very design system is my passion. Um, but in reality, that's the backstage, that's the secret that I want to share. We, um, so if you're watching this year, which you should, um, you best believe we'll be rocking some slippers and socks again. So you'll know, you all know the secret now. Um, this is an amazing conference. I might be biased. It's an amazing conference. And the lineup of speakers and uh, talks for this year is unreal. So I'll pass it on to Sil, who is going to tell you a little bit more about the conference. So thank you. Thank you, Andresa. Yeah, so to tell you a little bit about into design systems, I started this conference and community basically three years ago. So when I was working as a freelance design system designer, small team, most often a design system team of one. How many of you are design system teams of one, like very small teams? Yeah, cool. Yeah, so basically I was looking for help. I was uh, overwhelmed with work and I was looking for like-minded people. That's why I started into design systems. And it's pretty cool that now we do basically meetups worldwide. So I'm thrilled to announce our first chapter, which is going to take place in Australia, which is like amazing. I started this at home in my living room and now there is a meetup in Australia. So thank you so much to Richard and Mark for kicking this off. And we are looking for more chapter leads. If you want to organize an into design systems meetup here in London, if you want to continue this, talk to us. Um, maybe I could just use the clicker. <laughs> so basically we received a lot of great feedback from you. Um, people loved our conference. So that's why we decided to do another conference. And the next one is coming up in May. It's a three days uh, online conference. And like Andres, I mentioned, we have a massive lineup coming up. We have Nathan Curtis, super proud to have him presenting. We have Cynthia from Pinterest, Nate Baldwin, Romina from the design system dot guide, which is a really, really cool guide for beginners and pros. We have Jan Six from Token Studio, Varia, who should also be in the audience. Hello, welcome. Thanks for joining us from Finland, right? That's amazing. We have Davey from Meta. We have Sam, who's also one of our online hosts. And we have a lot of uh, topics and talks to talk about. Um, we make sure that our conference is very practical and hands-on because we believe that's the best way we learn. So there will be hands-on talks. 
You can check that out on the website. Just to quickly tell you what to expect, there's a three days full of, uh, of hands-on talks conference. You can learn the latest design system techniques. We will learn from real design systems examples because we love to see how people are working in their um, design systems, how they create stuff rather than you know, um, seeing a lot of, I don't know, companies presenting their custom plugins because design system teams of one or smaller teams can't use them. There's a very introvert friendly networking. We'll give you a short demo afterwards. Uh, you will get all the slides, also resources, fly, uh, files and templates from the speakers and a certificate to tell, uh, do you do tell your boss or to prove your boss that you have learned uh, something about design systems. <laughs> All right, to give you a quick demo. So um, here's um, Esther presenting how to, you know, how to really create tokens and stuff in Figma. And uh, this is our Q&A session. Andres and I collect all the questions in the Miro board and we make sure that all the, uh, all your questions will be answered. Um, last year we had the amazing team like Spotify answering all questions in the Miro board. I saw them at 2 a.m. in the middle of the night still answering questions. I'm like, what? <laughs> that was so amazing. Also, the, uh, our friends from Token Studio. It's a very introvert friendly way to, to network and collect resources. So yeah, we have 1,000 uh, people joining this conference all around the world. That's so amazing. Um, thank you to all of you, you know, uh, for, for supporting us and sharing stuff online or getting a ticket. Without you, this wouldn't be possible. So yeah, we can't wait to kick this off in May and to go online together. As you can see, we are a bunch of introverted design system friends. And yeah, if you want to join us and um, get a ticket, it's into designsystems.com and join Bruno, who is joining for the third year in a row <laughs> into design systems it's now three years old. So happy birthday. Yeah, last but not least, thanks to our sponsors, Panpot. Uh, super great to have Panpot as sponsor and Token Studio. All right, if you want to experience the introvert friendly, um, networking part, uh, feel free to scan this QR code and it should open hopefully Miro in the app or in the browser. Best experience is of course in the app, but at least you have the link. Okay. Otherwise, it's time to have a look at our Miro board and also welcome our online hosts because we have a lot of people in the stream, I assume. What's going on in the live stream? Hello. Is there anybody? Hello. Hello, hello, we are here, yes. Uh, yeah, everybody's uh, typing and saying hi from all over <laughs> the world. A lot of people want to connect to the mirror board. A lot of people send their LinkedIn details. We already shared our favorite colors. So all good here. Nice. That's amazing. And I got to say, everybody online is very jealous that they're not in that really beautiful room with you all right now. <laughs> and we're all getting very hungry about pizza and also lots of talks of pasta. So thanks for, you know, making us want pizza. <laughs> Cool, should we have a look at the mural board? Yes. Okay, wow, so many people here, 236 or something. So just to give you a demo how introvert friendly networking looks like. Uh, many people here connecting all around the world. And we are here in London. Many people here from the UK as well. Hello, everybody in the live stream. Let me quickly zoom out. So I just told you about the conference, but tonight you can also win a ticket to our conference. All you need to do is to post your event experience, take a photo and post it on 
social media and tag us to help spreading the word. And we will uh, announce one of the winners tomorrow. So if you want to win the ticket, help us to spread the word to make more design system friends. And that's basically it from my side. We will now start with the talks. Make sure to connect with our friends and our friendly hosts. And yeah, once again, thank you so much for joining us. And now it's time for the first talk, right? Andresa, let's announce the first talk together. <clears throat> Cool, cool, cool. Very excited to introduce our first talk. Um, when I was prepping his intro, you don't know who it is, it was on the website. Um, I actually realized that we have a lot of things in common. I think we both spent a few good few years of our lives in Dublin. Um, both of us, if you read our names on paper, I think the last thing you expect is an Irish accent to come in the end. Um, and I asked Christos for a fun fact, and he told me that once uh, he made a video of his cat that went viral and he got 7 million views. I don't have a cat, um, so we don't have that in common. Um, the, the other thing we have in common is that we were both really passionate about design systems, but only one of us works for a design systems that a design system that serves a product that is used for by over two billion people. Yeah, that's incredible. So yeah, I'm talking about Christos Castredis. Did I get it right? Um, yeah, who is a soft, uh, product designer here at Meta, and he's going to be telling us about all about um, design systems, the WhatsApp way. I'll give it up for Christoph. Thank you. Hello. Oh, my cat is no longer making TikToks. If that's what you were wondering, it was a it was a one time deal. You know, fame got to his head a little bit. So I'm going to share a couple of things about design systems at WhatsApp, whether you're a small team, a big team, uh, or just starting out. Hopefully there'll be a couple of tidbits that you'll pick up and you can use within your, your own work. So I'm Christos. I'm a staff product designer at WhatsApp, and I've been dabbling within design systems for the last seven or so years. It's quite a long time, actually. Um, but I guess I really like the variety of the work that we get to do and the reach and the impact that we can that we can do. It's it's pretty it's pretty exciting. Of course, I have to explain what WhatsApp is. If you don't use it, you know, nothing against you. You know, there's some other good apps out there as well. But really, what we're trying to do is connect the world privately. So we try to build messaging and calling that feels simple, reliable, and private. And that's pretty much it. You know, we want people to be themselves, speak freely, and just feel close to those, those uh, important connections. And I think it's worked pretty well so far. We're, you know, there's more than 2 billion people use our products every day in a lot of countries. And for me, I usually feel like quite a sense of pride, but also like as a design systems person, it's absolutely terrifying because anything that can go wrong will go wrong. And it affects billions of people, not just like a couple of folks. So um, yeah, that's like, pretty tough, but um, WhatsApp has predominantly had these product principles, design principles that have really gotten us to where we are. Um, some, of them, some of the really interesting things is just around uh, native. Uh, you know, We're mostly a mobile predominant um, app, and we think about products very differently for each individual prop, uh, platform with you know, as a design systems, that's like your ultimate nightmare is having like looks and feels and patterns that are completely different across every single platform. But we're trying to get away from there a little bit. Um, and you're probably wondering, you know, Christos, when did design systems start at WhatsApp? And it was a lot sooner than you would think. I joined back in 2020 as a contractor just to figure out what the hell design systems would look like. And it wasn't really until 18 months, two years ago, that we officially became a cross-functional team. And now we're at the point where we're doing some pretty interesting stuff um, that I'm excited to share. 
Our team is, I would say, quite interesting and maybe a little bit different to most teams. We are the foundation and brand team. So we are made up of product designers that you know typically focus within design systems, but it's not the only thing that we do. We have brand designers, creative directors, and these are folks that think about the brand experience within product. And I find that us being part of the same team works pretty damn good, works pretty good. Uh, we have quite a few engineers, nine, 10, and we focus mostly, um, well, while we're a multi-platform, we focus mostly on Android and iOS. That's where we put our big bets into. Um, you know, our team's purpose is really to evolve the look and feel of our products, to simplify the core experience, and to grow our design system through different tools and infrastructures, depending on the needs of our organization. And, you know, we support quite quite a few people. Like there is, you're probably thinking, Chris, what the hell? How is there a hundred designers within WhatsApp? There are a hundred designers in WhatsApp, um, thousands of engineers, and we provide the typical things that most design system teams provide. So I won't get into that too much, but WhatsApp is on a lot of platforms. Um, Wear OS, um, VR, like really? Um, Mac, Windows, all these other different platforms that we have to think about. But like I said, if we focus mostly on Android and iOS, that's where the real value is. So in terms of like one thing I'm really proud about of with our team is just our reach and our influence within our org. We've gotten to the point where we're kind of up here. You know, we focused within design first. Um, you're a design-led organization, or at least were at some point. Um, and then doubled into engineering, and now we're uh, impacting, you know, marketing, data science, insights, um, product, lots of other little spaces, which is um, really the place to be. But of course, we started very slow, and it was during a bleak 2020 in COVID, and we were just here, just in that little bubble there. Um, it was me as a contractor, one full-time designer, and about 15 designers. Those were simpler times. In terms of our influence, it was quite minor. There wasn't a whole lot that we could do in a sense. A lot of designers, while they appreciated the, the thought of design systems, were not familiar with design systems. And so building trust took us quite a long while. But fortunately, we had a sponsor. Our head of design was the one that saw the value and, and the potential of our team and really kept us pushing forward. So, you know, during this period, we were mostly a support oriented team, but there wasn't like actual products that we could ship, ship yet. So we focused on some of the more important aspects. You know, I joined a, at a time when everyone at Meta used Sketch. You know, have you tried to move people from Sketch to, to Figma or vice versa? It's so hard. <laughs> So hard. And then you learn how they were designing things in the past, like, oh my God. We ran quite a few different surveys to just understand like, how the hell do you design? Like, what do you really need? And like, how can we serve you best? And a lot of that, like with most design systems, it's building component libraries, but we, we built, oh. That was my alarm to take my uh, contact eye drops, but I'll have to have to wait a little bit. <laughs> so yes, we focused on component libraries, but Again, we didn't have components to provide, so we, we focused on what people needed the most within the current WhatsApp experience today. Whether it made you question lots of different things, we just wanted to provide what was there, and, and that seemed to work quite well. One of the things with being on, or focusing on Android and iOS and, and different mobile platforms is, you know, we actually relied quite a lot on iOS and the material guidelines, which if you're a small team, I would definitely, definitely recommend. It, answered a lot of questions that teams needed and it helped us pivot and focus on some different kinds of problems. And of course, we started our office hours very early into the process and to really just understand what kind of questions people are asking, what they were running into, and, and if there was different opportunities for us to explore in the long run. And so building trust was definitely, again, it took time. Uh, we had to accept that, you know, ad hoc requests and, and support, we had to embrace that a little bit. So if someone just pings you out of the blue, you were, you were on it. You were there to sort their problems out. Um, we managed to build a bit more trust during different collaborative workshops. So different teams were working on different 
uh, different visions. So we would go in there, share our expertise and build trust gradually that way. But I think the really exciting thing for us was even though we weren't, we didn't have any engineers, we were able to pivot towards certain business priorities, such as the Android app refresh that we did back in 2021. So all of those colors that changed, that was, that was me. Um, so it meant that we were able to like bring in product impact really early into the, into the, uh, the journey of our design systems team, which um, definitely brought us a lot of advantages, but it brought us a lot of challenges too, you know. Um, starting grassroots is really hard, trying to build that value, um, that limited scope that you have to do things, especially if you've been on design systems teams before where you've had like much more interest um, or like a bigger team, it's, it's definitely challenging. And, and even like us pivoting towards those different business priorities, like doing an app refresh is like <laughs> super challenging, by the way. But, but also like for us, we were questioning whether that was what a design systems team should be doing. Shouldn't we be focusing on like building out the foundations and working on different components? And, and normally the answer is yes, but this is what the company needed. And we had the skill set to give them that. And so it worked out for us. But now we're getting to the point where we're starting to feel like a bit of a real team. Um, I don't know if you know that meme. This is like my take on it. You do? Yeah. yeah I see a few faces, a few nods. Nice, nice, nice. And so now we've kind of gone through the, to the, the stage of design know what we're up to. They appreciate our work. Uh, they always ask us for help. But the engineering space, that's when things get really, really interesting. And, you know, early 2021, or actually I say it was probably about Halfway into 2021, we started, no, 2022. I don't know, I'm mixing up my years. Um, it's been a long time. Um, we started an iOS and we're still trying to figure out what the hell our team's gonna look like. How are we gonna be structured? How are we gonna grow in the long term? Um, but what you might notice is that designing, our design work grew really, really fast within this time period. So we're still a team that don't have our own, don't have much of an offering beyond like Figma libraries that we don't actually own or maintain the, like the code. and the designers went up from 15 to 50. You're like, Jesus Christ, this is so many more questions, so many more support that we need to provide. And it's pretty overwhelming. But like I said, influence was pretty good among design. Like they saw the value that we were bringing. Um, but awareness beyond that was very challenging. I feel like this is where a lot of us get really stuck and, and, and also just, like I said, figuring out what our team looks like. But we had two sponsors instead of one. We had someone from engineering and that made all the difference. So now we're starting to get to the point where we're figuring out, okay, what kind of components are we going to build? And now we can start providing our own do documentation, our own stamp. We know what the problems are in the org. We know what to, what to prioritize. And we also want to increase our support channels. So like, where are people reaching out to us? Where are the gaps? Some people are really introverted and don't want to go to office hours and, and talk on a VC. Some people just want to send you a question. You need to have, you need to have places for all those different things. <sighs> Building trust. There was a lot we had to do during this period. Uh, you know, this is it's so overwhelming. Like, no matter what size team you are, this is really hard. Figuring out what your vision is, getting feedback from a larger group. This was a big thing that we did. So anything that we were working on, we didn't keep it to ourselves. We got involved in the typical design process in our org, which were design reviews, builder reviews. Uh, and we would try and get that feedback from everyone. And it really helped us figure out, like, communicating the value of each component that we're working on and, and getting buy-in that way. And then also just talking about quality, like what the hell is quality? Everyone has different opinions of what that is. And so I'll share a little bit more about like how we were framing that and how it worked out for us. And, and yeah, under, understanding success, like how many times have you seen uh, posts or threads about like communicating the value of your design system? It's like the hardest thing in the world. But this is what our team vision was back at this point. So we wanted to structure it in a way that had a clear set of sub goals that we could achieve during each phase of our team. So typical, the building blocks, focusing on new development, where, where the new problems were that we could help solve and then get into a stage where we had system maturity. Is this still totally accurate? I don't know, man. If I go back, I'd probably change a few things, but this is what we did. We're probably somewhere, uh, somewhere in the middle of the, the ladder too. That's kind of where we're at at the moment. This is how we talked about prioritizing the things that we were building. So we focused on demand, wanted to understand what kind of patterns we were seeing across different design reviews, what people are coming to us with, 
are people trying to build very similar things? If, if so, that's like the best place to start instead of building like very typical components that you know will get used eventually, but you probably don't need to do it right now. And also, you know, how universal is this thing that we are building kind of be used across enough services? What is the like the potential within it? And then being a mobile oriented team, um, what kind of amb ambiguity is there with like existing documentation? Like are there gaps there that we can uh, pivot towards and, and, and solve um, those kinds of problems? And that was, that was kind of how we talked about why we did certain things. And, it, and then even just talking about quality, we had like a, lots of really long docs explaining, you know, this is the craft, this is usability, this is performance, et cetera. But those things are just really hard to explain to people that have no concept of design systems or have their own concept of design systems. And we just summarize it down to five points really, which I'm sure you'll all agree is pretty straightforward stuff. Um, for us, our focus was really on communicating the, um, I'd say just how jam packed the components that we build. So making sure things work with dynamic type. So many people at WhatsApp use large font sizes, use different modes, different accessibility settings. So we built a tool to demonstrate all of that. Anyone at WhatsApp could add their component to this library and test all of these different controls and know upfront if this thing's even working or not. What is success? That is the, it's like the meaning of life within design systems. Um, and I think it varies depending on your org and how you sit and what people care about. But these were some of the things that we had envisioned starting out. This is what I wanted us to focus on. And I think it was important to be real about what we feel is really impactful and what is maybe not so impactful, but still great at communicating the value of your system. And it really depends on what stage you are at um, within your team. But I always found um, different things that were affecting the, the customer, different ways of impact tracking was where like the secret sauce is at. Same for tech debt too. Our company really cares about tech debt, app size, crash rate, stuff like that. So we made sure we were able to talk about those different things. These are just some, some examples that we use to communicate our work, track uh, Figma usage uh, across different designers and seeing if people are actually using them more, if they're being more productive. Uh, how are we doing support wise? Like, are we making any optimizations and showing our breadth of impact so that like this last year we were, we were able to support 370 different projects in comparison to 250 the year before and then 88 the year before that. So that sh that, those are really powerful things that you can just talk about in one line. Uh, same for tech debt. There's like so much different ways you can talk about this. And these are just some of the examples of, of, um, of how we talk about things. And we don't talk about them all at the same time. It just depends on what's important in that, in, in that moment. Um, same for time efficiencies. You can talk about really simple things like introducing tokens or modes within Figma. You know, like for us, we had separate libraries for light mode and dark mode. And if you ask the de designer to do the whole screen in, in dark mode, it would take a very long time. So, you know, 15 minutes to five seconds, sweet. Uh, or you could be a little bit more whimsical and talk about if they built buttons to the same level of rigor that we did, it would take you 164 years, which it's probably not completely true, but you get the point, right? It's trying to communicate that narrative of the, the value and the minute just work that goes into what we do. Same for impact tracking. There are certain infrastructure projects, certain component migrations, uh, visual refreshes. These are super powerful. And uh, for us, that's how we've been talking about it for the last year. And uh, it's meant that we, uh, let me see if it works meant that we actually haven't had to focus on some of these other aspects yet, but I think as our system grows, we'll probably be um, revisiting some of those things again. And, and some of the big challenges was, you know, the expectations on our team were so much higher. We weren't just this little cute team in the corner. We were now our own pillar being compared to like hundreds of different people that were doing the same processes that we had to do, which was so, so hard. Um, and even just transitioning from a support focused team to execution focus is really, really difficult because you care about supporting everyone, but you also have to focus on your own projects and keep making sure that those are moving as well. And that was, um, that was quite a hard moment for us as well. And, and even just with WhatsApp, like WhatsApp scaled so much while we were there, but we were still a little team at this point. And just the velocity of what they were shipping, what we were able to catch and what we were able to support, we were still, we were still behind. And, I think the hardest thing is really just stakeholders, man, and just misunderstanding how we were talking about different things. We kind of went in with the assumption that everyone gets design systems, so we're just going to talk about it in one way, but we learned the hard way that 
you know, an eng director will care about things differently compared to a product director. Same for a design director, and it's okay to talk about your design system in a different lens depending on who you're speaking with. And yeah, that was that's be like the number one thing. Talk about your design system in in different ways to different people, and you will have uh, less misery, maybe. <laughs> Now we're getting to like the fun stage where we're starting to expand our scope a little bit. We started to take on a lot more bigger, meatier projects that people really just didn't think that we could do and, and we did it, so ha. Huh. So yeah, now we are, we're beyond the lens of engineering. We're looking into that amazing spectrum of product and insights and all these lovely fellas that don't know an absolute thing about design systems. So it's, it's, it's an exciting, exciting place to be really. And our team grew quite a bit. We're at 15 now instead of four. And you know, our influence was looking pretty good right now. We were, we've proven ourselves time and time again that we are drivers of change, that we can do things that other teams within WhatsApp aren't able to do. And they look to us to take these things on, which means that your opinion adds a lot more weight. You, can, you have a lot more say in, in how you want to drive WhatsApp or, or your own company as, as a whole. I mean, you're just one perspective, but your perspective matters. And I think that that's just kind of nice and just having lots of sponsors within different parts of the org so there was people in accessibility and marketing they all saw the value that we brought they all saw the potential of what we could do to uh, spearhead things and move whatsapp as a design org as an organization forward so some of the things we did in terms of design support again it was, we weren't able to focus on it as much in this period but tokens and variables i'm sure you're all very big on tokens right now. Uh, we, ooh, pizza. Um, sorry. <laughs> I forgot my lactose tablets. <laughs> anyway, um, tokens and variables, that's, one, that's a really big thing we did this year. Um, we, want, we wanted to do it for a really long time, but again, it's all about finding the right opportunity to do these things and not having to do it straight away just because the feature came out last week. Now, we used this as a time to streamline our, our Figma libraries. We had quite a few Figma libraries. We wanted to make that much more tidy and make people really aware of like, this is actually owned by our team and this is just WhatsApp products, right? And with doing all these really big product initiatives, we wanted to make sure that our support channels were still being looked after. So we did quite a few different things to look at optimizing that. And of course, workshops. Workshops are your best friends. Just show people in person how it works, let them try out different things and then they'll remember it forever. Or, or maybe if you do it just before Christmas and they come back in the new year, they won't, which is what I did. I'm kidding, most of, them, most of them got it. So at this point with us, what we did to build trust, we focused on multiple AppBoy component and infrastructure migrations. And the way we were trying to frame it was these things can unlock bigger initiatives for us and the org. So that's, that's, that was kind of our segue. And we were at a point you know, where we were able to drive a new design direction and vision, which I can't show any screenshots of because we're still testing it. But if your app is a little different, um, you know, I'm... I'll say no more. And we were getting to the point where we were starting to build a lot of excitement internally and externally, you know, that was pretty good. And then even just helping out in places where we didn't before, especially on the engineering front, you know, our, our org, our WhatsApp really cares about better engineering. There was lots of like optimizations that we could do in their own time while design were focusing on different kinds of problems. And that just added so much more weight to what we were doing. I don't know how many teams migrate their components across the entire app, but this is kind of how we talked about it at least. Uh, it's always so much more complicated than you think, but we tried to break things down into what the kind of visual impact was, uh, if this fragmentation was acceptable or unacceptable. You know, if this is something that's being migrated across your core services, it's probably unacceptable um, or acceptable. I don't know. I'm confusing myself. And even just the feasibility, something that might feel really simple or look easy to migrate is probably, there's probably five or 10 different variations of that component in your code base. And that's one thing you need to do your investigation upfront and really communicate that. And all of these things play a key role in just estimating how long these things will take. And we prioritize things a little differently. So pillars were now doing their own visions at the start of the year, which gave us an opportunity to see what teams were thinking about upfront, if there was any patterns there for us and opportunities for us to prioritize throughout the year. And the same goes for what kind of components are heavily used across our app that can help WhatsApp feel more modern. Um, but more importantly, are there opportunities out there that will help us unlock bigger things? And are these things that we've had on, on our radar for a while 
most of the time the answer is yes. How are we doing time-wise? Oh, my stopwatch is not working. Uh, so some of the challenges, you know, this was a year where WhatsApp really wanted to focus on efficiency and doing efficiency right with, with purpose and intentionality was really difficult for us. And we also felt that at times we were neglecting other parts of our system. So when it comes to documentation, Figma maintenance, like evolving those were kind of left behind during this period. And uh, one of the other things, if you're doing like really big migrations or, or refreshes or anything of that nature, like regressions hit hard. So like metrics going up and down and all the time that it takes to, to fix those is, is really difficult. But I feel like we've, we've learned a lot about uh, how to fix those up front. So if you're gonna, yeah, be, be, be aware about that. Things are gonna take longer than you think they'll take. And it wouldn't be um, a design system to talk without talking about building natively versus custom. We've kind of reached a point where we've stretched how much like what is what comes out of the box is it, like works for us. And you know, WhatsApp, because we have so many people that use our products, we have to support so many different uh, iOS versions as well. So it means like all the cool stuff that comes out, we have to wait like two or three years and that's not really nice. That's not all. There is a couple of things I'll wrap up with, just a couple of little takeaways. I feel like I've probably talked too long and I'm sorry, but I would say just don't be a yes person. Um, it's so easy to say yes and help people all the time, but you really have to say no and focus on the right things. Make the smart choices. What are the things that can help you build trust right now? Is this project even the right moment to pick this thing up? Most of the time, the answer is probably no. And the, what, the design system's life is non-linear. You don't have to focus on all the foundations, all these different components, and then start getting adoption. Honestly, like any other product team, um, you know, it's spaghetti, right? Everything is all over the place. Uh, but as long as you're thinking about what the company really needs and how you can best pivot to that. Um, and even just when it comes to process, I've found that like when we try to do so much process up front, all these new docs, they all just kind of sat there and started gathering dust and like the art of creating it was great but the upkeep wasn't really efficient for us so I think just like figure out what you really need and just being like it's okay to be scrappy I really like this one be a magpie um, look for the shiny things look for the things that will build stakeholder buy-in these are usually like the business priorities again I'll keep saying business but it's so important for design systems and these are usually problems that can unlock bigger initiatives for your org and are just really cool to work on as well. And for me, this has been the best way for us to build trust and impact within our org. So it doesn't always have to be components, but sometimes it can be. And yes, building natively versus custom. I could probably write a thesis on this, but basically the answer is it depends. Personally, I think native isn't for everyone. It can be inefficient at scale, uh, it drives me nuts. Um, but if you're a small org starting out, you're trying to get a design system up and running, I think this is like a really powerful place to start. Uh, it gets your product teams thinking about platform standards. Um, even if it doesn't look exactly the same, I think there's a lot of paradigms there that you should leverage. Whereas custom kind of starts to give you more control at scale, uh, fewer growing pains, uh, but it has less out of the box support. So, you know, like when we talk about accessibility and all the little controls and things that you you probably forget about sometimes. Um, and I think it's just a matter of where you draw the line. Like, do you want to look native? Do you want to feel native? Or do you want to use the actual SDK and code base? And these are some things to like really think about before you start. And yeah, I know we talk about adoption a lot in design systems, but I've always wondered, like, have you just tried migrating it yourself? I know a lot of teams maybe aren't in the position to do that. And yes, you build much less components, but you do gain a deeper understanding of the app, how it works, and probably realize just how awful it is. You get to build rapport with, with teams early. You know, you're talking to them way earlier than you, than you might before. And, um, and, you get, and you just get a sense of just like how product teams actually shift, uh, ship work. Like when we pivoted, we realized, oh my God, like we've been doing things totally different. But I think the closer you align to how your product works, it just makes a lot of that conversation easier and mitigates some of that rogueness up front. And that helped us gain a lot of, a lot of respect as well. I think when we talk about design systems, what's, what's helped with us is to talk about the, act, the outcomes, not the activity itself. So like one of the things we worked on this year was uh, implementing a unified multi-platform color system that addressed over 9,000 color aliases. That was, that was, a, that was a hard project. Um, and while that sounds really cool, really what it did, 
is it unlocked lots of new fun initiatives and just broader platform adoption. And that's kind of the way to think about things when you're talking about it to people that don't really know what the system is. And I will end, this is the last slide, everyone. I will end with empathy. We build systems for people. Um, I, even, I don't know if you've tried to do some product work lately, but it's really hard. And uh, <laughs> you're using your own components day to day. And it's definitely made me realize a couple of things. And you know, work, work is hard for everyone. Everyone's working on multiple projects probably. Uh, have lots of expectations and deadlines to meet. So if someone detaches your component and forgets about it, just loosen up, man. Loosen up. Unless it's a bad one. Unless it's a really, really bad one, then you know, probably put your foot in there. But I think a lot of the time we can probably just let it slide for a little bit. Unless there's a pattern. Unless we're seeing a lot of people doing very similar things, then that's something to, to keep an eye on. And I will stop talking now. Thank you for putting up with my Irish nonsense. I will open the floor to any, any questions. Yeah. OK. Thank you so much, Christos. We still stand here. I have. Yeah, you are. If you are up so for a few center. questions. Are you okay to take a few questions? I would love some questions. Oh, lovely. Anyone uh, here? They might not like my answers, but. Anyone? Oh, so many. I'll go here first. Uh, thanks for your talk. It's great. Um, how would you, if you're going to carve the cake, how much of the cake is the craft of design system and how much of it is the, the kind of sales and politics of getting the thing off the ground? In your view, <laughs> in your world. Um, I think it really depends on, it depends on how, uh, how do I frame this? I could say this so many different ways, but I think it depends on the like maturity of your org, both as a design discipline and, and as a product. And I think for us, I will say as the, if you're in a much larger org, there's there's a lot more people you need to talk to. There's a lot more people you need to convince. And so naturally there is a lot of politics that come with that. Same with certain initiatives. Some people will care more about that. And again, that's more politics that you have to deal with. I think starting off within design systems is the best place to position yourself as teams of craft. And I would say just trying to, trying to keep doing that is, is the main thing, but it's definitely easy to get sideways with the politics and that's part of that's part of it right like you're trying to communicate your value and you want to you want the business to care about the work that you're doing and sometimes politics gets more in the way of craft but i would say like and a lot of stuff that we build you know when we built it at the time we thought yeah this is like great this is sorted we won't have to deal with this again you'll probably have to deal with it in six months time or a year's time or two months time you know the needs etc will grow quite a bit and um, but i say like craft is something we do really care about but it's it's a really hard thing to even um have product teams do at, at the level that we probably have i like to think that as design systems teams it's on us a lot of times to hold that really high bar i think the more we can help other teams get to that level via different tools or different kinds of automation that's the way we should probably go um, that's not something we do really well at, at WhatsApp in terms of like tooling and automation. It's it's something I'm really keen on, on us prioritizing. Um, that that is the long-winded answer. Who's next? Do we have time for more? Yeah, we it's have kind of fun. one more. Sorry, I think they had to the hand up first. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I joined a bit late. You might have answered this question. How do you mesh? I mean, I have hundreds of questions to ask, but if I have to choose one, how do you measure the adoption of your design system? Um, I mean, the simplest place to start is something like call sites where you're just getting a literal number of where these things are, how much of this is being adopted, but it doesn't paint the whole picture. It doesn't tell you where it's being adopted. Is it being adopted on the right services? One thing we're trying to try this year is just visual coverage. So are the core services of our product being adopted by our design system? If so, how much? That's a bit more straightforward than talking about just a number. That's what we're trying to do at the moment. 
Um, but like I said, a lot of the projects we've been doing have been focused on app wide migration. So naturally the adoption is going to be pretty high for, for a lot of things. You're getting asking all the hard questions, adoption and politics. I want more hard questions. <laughs> Talk to me afterwards. Cool. Oh, appreciate that there's lots of questions here, but we also have folks online. So maybe I'll ask a question from um, those that shared on Miro. So there is a question here around um, advice for a design system team lacking visibility um, to increase their impact. So do you have any tips, advice? Lacking visibility? Yeah, within the organization. I suppose I would ask where are they, where are they sharing their work? Um, maybe there's a, a, there's certain places that it's not being shared. Um, even if like, I think for us, we, we ran into that as well. Like we didn't want things to just be an echo chamber. Uh, if your design team has all hands, if there's product meetups, anything like that, use any opportunity to go in and talk about your work and explain what it is. Try to find certain sponsors or stakeholders that really care about your work and funnel it up to them. Like really, that's what, if there's a manager, if there's a lead on your team, that's what they should be doing too, is really just spreading spreading the word. Finding your allies, yeah. Yeah, sure. yeah. yeah. finding you. all your friends. Um, I'm seeing the question here and I'm wondering if it's from someone from my team, my team in work. Um, they're asking because we we go through, you spoke a little bit about support there um, and we go through a lot of challenges on managing support. So uh, the question here is how do you prioritize support from teams to ensure that you're getting enough time to focus on improving um, the assets, the libraries and documentation? Yeah. Um, I think about what we did and I don't know if it worked super well but it's worked pretty good so far is we all committed like a certain amount of capacity that we wanted to dedicate su towards support so we said 80 percent of our time is on product work 20 percent is towards support then we tried to figure out how are we supporting teams like what are those channels so we do like a group where people can post questions we rotate who um who answers those questions um what else do we do same with our office hours. We don't all go to office hours. We rotate that as well. I'm trying to think what else. Oh, one thing that actually worked really well for us, we, we started doing like async feedback where people could just go to a sign-up sheet and just uh, leave a link to a Figma and we'd check it in two days or so. So it gave us a bit of a window where like, your thing might not be answered right now, but that's where we were pushing people. So we didn't want people to ping us directly. We'd say, have you tried going to office hours or have you tried going to async feedback? And actually that like really helped a lot when we were trying to do some of the bigger projects. And um, we actually noticed that more people ended up using our async feedback, which is why our support metrics went up so much. Like the same amount of people were coming to office hours, but the same amount were signing up, you know? I would say try, try and consider different, you know, like more async ways of, of getting that support and and pushing people don't be afraid to push them you know if someone pings you directly just say no go go here i'll get back to you in two days i know it doesn't sound nice but you have to do it sometimes you have to look after yourself as well and your own team yes certain things you have you have to do to drive the adoption but then after you can put more guard rail as i suppose yeah, yeah yeah cool thank you so much um everyone give it up for crystals thank you so much Um, we um yeah that was an amazing talk uh so many tips even personally that i'll take so thank you for that christos um our next talk um very exciting as well um when i was again preparing her intro um looked for things that we had in common and we do have a lot of things in common we are both part-time educators um, we both collect vinyls. We, we, we should be sharing some repeats or something. Um, and I also asked Marianne if he, she had any fun facts to share. Um, and she had the best fun facts. I don't think anyone can top that. So sorry, Crystal. You, your cat was, it was cool. But um, Marianne actually accidentally auditioned for a Beyonce music video. Um, she didn't get it, so thankfully she's here now today uh, to talk about design systems. Uh, Marianne, she is the head of design systems at ITVX. She's formerly uh, led design as well in CNN, and she's going to be talking to us about design systems, the lean approach. 
very interesting. Um, yeah, everyone give it up for Marianne. Hello, can you hear me? <laughs> right. Hi, everyone. Um, so, yeah, I did audition accidentally for a Beyonce music video, <laughs> uh, but hopefully I'm in the right place tonight. <laughs> um, but another confession, this is actually my first time presenting at a meetup, so please be gentle with me. <laughs> Safe word, jelly bean. Okay. <laughs> So thanks everyone for joining like in person and online. I'm really excited to share my thinking and thoughts and, and framework. Um, it's, it's called Lean DS. So I have coined slash stolen that, that name from Jeff Gorthoff. So sorry, whoops. <laughs> um, but it, hopefully it'll make sense as I go through. Um, and it's, it's, it's essentially a framework um, from my experience working on design systems in an enterprise uh, environment and, and my kind of thoughts on how you can tackle systems in those complex environments. So hopefully you'll be able to take away some, some interesting bits and pieces. Well, I hope you find it interesting. <laughs> So first up, I thought I'd just introduce myself again. So sorry, <laughs> um, just for those that don't know me. So yeah, I am currently head of design systems at ITVX. Um, previously, I was design lead at CNN, where I spent uh, nearly sort of seven years there working on the design system there. Um, I've been sort of dabbling in design for in the design sphere for the last 15 years. So I've been really lucky to work with some really uh, incredible people and brands but I'd say that one of the career highlights was uh, naming the CNN design system Bossy. So, and yeah, that was named after the Stormzy track Bossy Bop. <laughs> it, took, it took a while till people like clocked on to that one. So yeah, great achievement there. <laughs> um, so before I jump in, I'll just do a quick summary of what you can expect from this talk and you can decide then if you want to leave. So yeah, but please stay. <laughs> Um, so first up, what I want to share are my methods and approach for uh, research within a design system team. Then how you can then ensure that your design system moves with the organization rather than against it. And then finally, looking at how you can then synchronize all those things and balance it in a realistic sense with the resources and, and kind of scope that you have within your capacity. I thought I'd start first by talking about the perceptions of a design system within an organization, because we all know here that perception is, is very different to reality. And to external teams and people, design systems can often be perceived and assumed to just, you know, we've got everything in place and it's, it's ready to go and it always fits perfectly. Uh, and, you know, it, we all know that it's an evolving thing. It's never perfect. And I also find that, from my own experience anyway, I'm curious if others feel the same, we're always expected to move really, really fast all the time. Like teams will kind of come to us and they want you to react often quite quickly. And it's quite easy to fall into that sort of support and response team mentality, um, which is a tricky one. The bottom gift's not working, sadly. But controversially, I think sometimes from an outsider, the design team can sometimes be seen as just like the fun team. <laughs> Everyone's like, oh, they just sort of do what they do their thing. They have lots of fun. Um, and I think all these things are true to a design system team in, in, some, in certain amounts. And we do have lots of fun. And, you know, we can work really quickly. And sometimes things do fit perfectly. But sometimes the reality is a little bit more like this. I know personally, I've often felt like little Oliver over there kind of asking for more, you know, more adoption, more support, more resources. And then in turn, you then often end up feeling like the fella at the bottom. It's fair to say that design systems are one hell of a ride. There's all different chops and turns and, you know, it's a journey. <laughs> And it's no wonder, really, when you actually think about the design system life cycle. 
If we look at the beginning, when you're in the growth phase, you're focusing purely on adoption and the energy levels are like up here. It's just like, it should probably be more called like the, the party time phase. It's just fun, it's frantic, but it's exciting, it's energetic. Yeah, you might have a little bit of resistance, but it's, you know, it's all good. You then might glide into the optimization phase. And this is where it starts to get a little bit tricky, but it's still like fun zone. It's still like when you start to really start thinking about standards and best practices and the changes that you want to make and things that you want to establish. And then you might even start doing things from scratch. So it starts feeling like really rewarding really quickly. Then things around phase three start to sort of dip a little bit off the party track, still like fun, but it goes a little bit more into like business strategy track. And your organization might have gone through some changes. Teams might have spun up. Teams might have broken down. And the needs for the design system team may have expanded or even pivoted. And senior management might even be saying things like, but isn't the design system finished now? If you're at this point, then you know full well that it's certainly not finished. If anything, you're actually at a point where the workload of the design system team has actually doubled or tripled. There's actually so much to do. But the organization at this point needs more buy-in. So your strategy has got to change. And then finally, if you're lucky enough to get to the final stage, the final level, <laughs> you might have reached the full design system maturity stage and hit the maintenance territory. And you're now just an abundance of gray hair and kind of more fine lines. And it's still fun, but it's challenging, but it's a whole other ball game in terms of negotiation, the strategy, the work. It's a, it's a, it's a lot more of a logistical challenge. And I'm kind of wondering, I'm assuming, but I feel that those that were interested in my talk tonight, I'm assuming that you might be in one of these two phases. And if so, you might actually relate to this meme, which a colleague sent to me. Because <laughs> yeah, there is quite a big difference between building a design system and maintaining one. And I'd just sort of show a hand on if anybody else sort of feels a connection to this weathered guy. <laughs> on the right. <laughs> Thanks, I see you. <laughs> so let's not get too Debbie Downer about design systems because most of us been there, seen there and got the t-shirt. And yeah, they might drive us a little bit loopy. They might make us question everything and they might just be endless conversations about buttons. However, they do provide, it's, it's unquestionable, they do provide great value to teams, businesses, and products, and that's why they are so rewarding. So let's look at some data to put that into perspective. In 2019, InVision published a report, so it's a little bit old now, but I feel that this still resonates. It was a report about design maturity across the digital landscape, so you might have seen this already. They had around 2,200 respondents and they were able to synthesize the data in a really interesting way. So what you can see here is that the output of levels had maturity ranked from level one to level five, with level five being the ultimate goal for like design maturity. So much so that these companies were labeled as the visionaries as they were the ones that were driving business strategy through design. And what separates this top 5% from the rest is that they were tackling design in a holistic 360 way. And therefore they are the ones that are seeing a huge financial impact within the business through design. And what was interesting was that one of the common threads in the maturity levels was that they had a significant presence and impact of the design system. So 82% of level five companies had established UI best practices and nearly 80% had also uh, regularly updated it. Whereas only 30% of respondents at level one said that they'd updated their design system and less than half had established best practices. So you can see there's quite a difference. And there's naturally many other 
uh, like aspects that do contribute to design systems, but it is evident to see that design systems are one of the key tenants of design maturity within the business. And why should the business care about design maturity? So this is another bit of data from the same report, and I think that these numbers do speak to them for themselves. What you can see here is that level five companies have a four times, excuse me, four times more impact on revenue than level one, five times more impact on cost saving, six times more impact on time to market, and a whopping 26 times more impact on the company's valuation. So they're not really numbers to be snubbed at. That's kind of quite impressive when you see that difference. So when you see that wider impact of design on the business and the ecosystem that it lives in, it's important that we continue to shout from the rooftops that design systems aren't just a design thing. And we all know that, and they are so much more. However, more recently, there was another report released in Zero Hype, by, by Zero Hype, and there were a couple of data points that specifically spiked my interest, and the first was this one, and it said that 66% of the respondents said that they set goals for their design system, and I saw this and I thought, that's awesome, but then this one left me a little bit uncertain, because when asked further about where their goals and the broader, about their goals and the broader alignment, the numbers were a little bit lower. So 38% aligned to their organizational goals and 36 to product goals. So combined, those figures are relatively positive, but individually, they're actually lower than I personally would have expected. And the reason I think this is because aligning your design system to your organization and product, product goals, it's incredibly fundamental in today's vulnerable market because design systems sadly are a very vulnerable space within larger businesses. I'm a big fan of Stafford Beer, his great name. Um, and he was one of the godfathers of cybernetics, which is the science of systems. I don't know if anyone's familiar with Stafford Beer and his work. He created many models and frameworks which were mainly for operational efficiency, predominantly in the eighties. And most of these models are still relevant today. In 1985, he wrote a book called Diagnosing the System, and that's where this quote comes from. And I really love it because I actually see quite a lot of relevance to this quote, from this quote, to design systems. It's a little bit of cheeky kind of stealing again. <laughs> um, and I think it's true because I do believe that a design system can only really survive in a particular sort of environment because you do need the buy-in and the support and the existence of a design system and the design system team is often somewhat separate you know we always sit slightly on the outside and that does work because we do need that level of autonomy and space but for me the most key part of this statement is the last part is that it cannot survive in a vacuum you can't isolate the design system and not kind of lean back into the business. A design system needs to connect and work with and for the users and the business. So let's talk about research. I uh, like to break research into three key areas, awareness and perception, usability and discoverability, Adopt an adoption and contribution. So for the focus, oh, again, tongue twisted. For the purpose of this framework, I'm referring to internal user research, so not the users at the end of the product. And worth also noting that the scope and, and cadence of the research depends on your business and, and focus area. So these are kind of more you know, rough kind of my take on this. But I'll go into each of these in a, in a moment. If we zoom out a little bit and think for a second about the overarching areas of focus of a design system, then essentially I think it boils down to two primary areas, infrastructure and then the operational. And what I mean by infrastructure is that is the core of the design system, the libraries, the design talk and the documentation the pieces that are the heart of everything that we base everything around. 
And what I mean by operational is essentially workflow, communication lines, basically anything that is created to ensure that the infrastructure thrives. You could in, in some ways also say that this is where it starts to blend and step a little bit more into the world of design ops or when you get more into the operational side of things. But what you can see with these three areas of re research is that one is tapping more into the infrastructure side, one more into the operational, and then one kind of blending and meeting both areas in the middle. So the key thing that I think when focusing on research with a design system is to think about how you are connecting from one side to the other in terms of that infrastructure to operational, because you do need that full breadth and that wide lens vision. If not, you kind of go down, well, you risk going down more of a kind of rabbit hole tunneled vision. So first up is adoption and contribution. And this is, I think these terms were originally coined by Nathan Curtis with adoption, essentially like how the teams are using it, like how often and how they're adding back into it. So essentially, if you think about your research in layers, this is the foundation. And when you're like up and running and you're, you're at a stage of consistency, you should aim really to be monitoring this regularly, I'd say monthly. And what you're looking for is quantitative data on your adoption and contribution rates. How you slice that is dependent on how you're set up and what data you have available. But as an example list, and this is no by no means exhaustive, you could do this in different ways, but just a few examples of types of things that you could measure. Figma analytics, deployed code. If you run triage sessions, is there a way you can track something there within those sessions or office hours? You might not have all the answers that you need straight away, but the key, the key uh, aspect with this is to start to try and figure out where you can gather some more consistent metrics to start building from. So try to spread your bets, so to speak, as the payback then will be greater. So you're covering a lot more. So what I mean by that is don't necessarily just focus on Figma data, look into potentially two or three areas so you have a good amount of comparative data. Usability and discoverability, this is the next level up. So this is the frequency of this uh, type of research reduces. And this is looking across infrastructure and operational aspects. You want to really get down to the ground here and, and actually understand how users are actually using the system day to day and not just looking at usage, but actually how it's functioning within the business. So you could be gathering a mix of quantitative and qualitative data. And in terms of frequencies, I'd probably aim for like every three months if possible. It depends on your team's structure and capacity and various things, but you can spread it out a little bit further. You could be running more scheduled surveys or user interviews, involving more people in kind of card sorting exercises or similar. You could also be broader than that. Uh, if you know that there is a specific pain point that you want to start kind of digging into more. Uh, as an example um, of something that we're doing at ITV is that we've introduced DevMod into our workflow. So we're monitoring quietly at the moment um, and we'll be gearing up for more focused data in terms of how well that's working in a couple of months, but we're starting to plant seeds and establish where there could be some consistent kind of feedback loops there. So I think top tip here would be making sure you do have that mix of qualitative and quantitative feedback because it helps to add a bit more substance to the conversations that you might have later down the line with your CPOs, CDOs, if you have one, <laughs> or CTOs, all the others. <laughs> um, and finally, top of the tower is awareness and percep perception. And this is purely qualitative data, to be honest. 
It's done a lot less frequently because you can then check in to understand perception. You can kind of put your finger in the air and see, you know, where, which way is the wind blowing kind of thing. And you start to gather a sense from the design system perce perception across the organization. And not just with primary and secondary users, but aim higher too. So reach out to senior management and gather feedback from all levels. So you get a little bit more kind of full scope of how things are kind of doing. You know, you might discover that senior management don't think too highly of the design system because they don't understand it, you know, compared to those that are using it day to day. And they might view it actually quite negatively. Hopefully that's not the case, but sometimes it can be. And if you did discover that, at least at this point, then at least you know then where you can start to focus your energy uh, and the buy-in. And you're not sort of, you've got more of a kind of a game plan for like who you need to talk to and your evangelizing efforts around it. So I think aiming to do this less frequently, sort of six to, to nine months, but again, it changes on how you're set up and what you feel is appropriate for your business and team. Uh, but less frequently is better because you don't really want to fatigue people. Uh, and I think it's a good distance then between the other data points to give people space. So if we were to take a look at how you could coordinate the research throughout the year, it could look something like this. Now, I'm pretty aware that this would have to be a very organized structure to be like working bang on these kind of time frames, but it was just for illustration purposes. If you could, if you could aim for something like this, then great, but it's obviously, you know, gotta be real about these things. <laughs> um, and you might need to just, yeah, flex timings and sort of change it down. And it's not, it's not about having it perfectly locked down. It's not about saying, you know, it has to be on this time. The key is about the rhythm and the routine, and it's making sure that you're gathering the feedback and analyzing it frequently, and you're having those conversations, and you're readdressing and trying to see where you're at, what's working, what's not, and, and start to kind of plan from there. So hopefully that all made sense and seemed simple and useful to follow. However, as we know, design systems are never just that simple. <laughs> We operate in spaces that can only be described as like trying to work on a moving train. I don't know if many people have kind of felt like this within the business. The business twists and turns, they move slowly and then they'll move quickly and then the design team are just expected to flex with it. It's part and parcel and part of the, the nature of a design system team. But there are things that we can do to help mitigate that pressure. So what if we had a design system framework? Q, <laughs> sole segue. Jeff Gorseth designed and created the Lean UX Canvas around 2016. And it's often used as part of the product design process. You've probably used this already within the teams and the business, or you might even already use it yourself. It's made up of eight pieces and its function is to build a shared understanding of the product users and the expected outcomes. It's an incredibly robust campus, and its aim is to help building hypotheses much easier. And the reason is that at the core of the Lean UX canvas is the goal that teams want to focus on outcomes and less on deliverables, which is perfect for design systems because we support this mission. We, you know, we focus on reducing the time for teams to not be thinking about the deliverables. I think I'm going to you get the gist. <laughs> However, personally, I've found that when trying to apply the Lean UX Canvas to a design system team, I started to hit a few hurdles. And there was a few gaps missing and how it connects then to the wider organization. So what I'd like to share with you now is my take on the Lean UX Canvas, but adapted slightly for design systems. And because for some reason I like to do things in threes, <laughs> uh, I decided to split the 11 sections over three key areas. Also inspired by Simon Sinek's golden circle. It starts with the why, so understanding the purpose, the what, understanding the drivers and motives, and it, then it concludes with the why, 
which is essentially a reality check of feasibility. And this is what it looks like. So you can see that the middle purple part is pretty aligned to the lean UX canvas, but I've sandwiched two additional sections on either side to provide and connect wider convert text. So I'll just walk you through it now. The first section is split into three parts, the wider organization, business goals and objectives and system problem. And I'll walk you through now, like high level. So, you know, kind of take it with a pinch of salt, but just some kind of just so you can see how you might fill out the, these types of canvases. Obviously, when you do it yourself, you probably would add a lot more detail and the information would be probably kind of structured slightly differently. So first up, the wider organization, let's say we are a media broadcast company serving video content across six platforms. If you work at an enterprise level, then this section could start getting quite complicated. But this is really beneficial because it's helpful for you to see where you fit in the big kind of pond. Next is business goals and objectives. So this could get quite detailed, but just for this presentation, I just kept it quite, quite high level. But let's say, as an example, the, the business want to improve workflow efficiencies. That's something that they're kind of keen on at the moment. And then product kind of business objectives might be increasing views or increasing subscriptions. Obviously, it changes depending on where you are working. And then system problems. Now, this could be a really long list, but remember that it's not a wish list. It's a list of actual problems. And this is where the data that you have would feed into this area because there might be efficacy problems in that users are not actually using the system very well. There could be workflow dependencies and teams see the design system as slowing them down. And there might be confusion around single source of truth because that's often kind of spoken about as well. The middle section is made up of five pieces, system users, user benefits and outcomes, metric and measurement solutions and hypotheses, which is very similar to the lean UX canvas. So as an example, again, system users, you might have primary and secondary users that work across so many squads. The benefits, you know, what do you expect the users to get from the design systems? You know, they can use it at ease, they can build and design faster. The usual things, test and ideate quicker, might have much more coherent UX and UI. But again, this might be different for your business. Metrics and measurements. This will also come from the research and the information that you've gathered and, and, and things that you already know. But as an example, you might know that there's tons of detached components each month. You may have started to track delivery, ticket, duration, and life cycle, like how long is it taking things to actually move through for the end-to-end -end process. You might have some external feedback in terms of ratings, and you might even be using kind of tools like chromatic from regression testing where you're able to sort of look at how frequently components are being updated in code as well. So lean into as much as possible in this area. And then solutions. This is where you can start to ideate loosely and start proposing some potential solutions on, on what you're seeing already. So improving element components because you've been notified in five triage sessions that things were missing. You might need to refine the workflow because you know teams are complaining that they're moving too slowly and it's been flagged quite a few times or you might not you know have a single source of truth and you need to mitigate that confusion and then the final piece is the hypothesis we'll come back to this once we've finished the last section so the final part of this framework is the feasibility aspect and this is where you have to be honest and clear about your team structure and any dependencies so many of you might be lucky to have a centralized, 100% centralized team of designers and developers. That can be quite rare. Sometimes, you know, smaller, it depends on the business size, especially in the current climate, it seems to sort of change. Um, but for my example here, um, and, and the way that we actually operate at ITVX is that we have a distributed model. So we have four centralized designers on my team and we have distributed engineering across six squads. So because we're distributed, we have a potential risk of dedicated engineering support. 
We're also impacted on time dependent work. Certain live events might mean we need to turn things around quickly and be a little bit more on hands on deck. So again, this will change depending on your business setup. And then the plan section. This is, does not need to be a detailed plan. That will come later when you actually start properly breaking down the work. Here, what you want to do is call out any planning goals at a higher level. For example, you might know up front that a live event, obviously I'm speaking quite specifically about ITVX, but I'm sure you have similar things within your different businesses. But you might know that something's happening in a certain quarter. So if you are, let's say, distributed, the likelihood of you getting engineering support in that quarter is going to be slim. So you kind of have to think about those types of things. You might need to adjust and think more about what can be achieved ahead. So that's where you then might think, well, if we're not going to get any engineers in this time or we can't do this in this time, then we just plan slightly differently. Maybe we do a bit more discovery in this time, in this time frame and then kind of Tetris it around in that way. And then you might also have other time sensitive things like the DevMod trial is ending. So you need to make sure that you've thoroughly tested it and that everybody is using it. <laughs> And some of these things can be seen as scope and risks. So it does blend a little bit. But what I would say is that the things that potentially are a little bit more time dependent, I'd probably keep them more in the, this area at the bottom, which is more the plan, because that's where it will then help you later on to coordinate everything when you start blending everything together. So if we jump back to the hypothesis box, now you've got all the information to start building a hypothesis and you can write this however you want and this is an example of how you can piece it together so worth mentioning that this is very long you know and when presenting this you probably would not relay this whole statement <laughs> to everybody but what's useful here is that you're, you're building that story in the same way that we're encouraged to do with the lean ux canvas and you're then keeping parts of it in your back pocket so you've got that almost I say ammo, but that sounds a little bit passive aggressive. But you know, you've got kind of the information there if you were questioned and you need to challenge anything. So let's see how this fits into the world. So again, this is quite high level just for the sake of this presentation, you can chop and change this. So I'll just show you how it could work. I sound like Neil Buchanan. Right, here's something I made earlier. Right, we believe that tackling workflow dependencies in line with our core streaming organization and our business objective to improve delivery and efficiencies, we will help our primary users, designers and developers to design and build faster with more coherent UX and UI. Success will be shown by shorter delivery tickets lifecycle. That could change and be a couple of things. We plan to achieve this through refining the current design system workflow. And our approach will be sort of supported by the core design system team what's considering team deadlines and releases and is part of our Q2 initiatives. So that framework is benefit, I'll just go back a little bit. So the framework is beneficial, but it's how you make it and how thorough you want to use it. And it's how you, you do want to structure it for what's required and what the needs are for your business. You might need, not need to cover all these things. And as mentioned before, you might not want to share all that information, but it's just helpful to ensure that you partner where you're going, what the strategy is with the regular research and just keep constantly evaluating so that you really do get the best from this type of kind of framework and thinking. It can't just be kind of one thing. They all need to kind of connect together. So to summarize the Lean DS with another list of three things, <laughs> there's lots of three things. Um, I'd say that once you have a framework and you start to define your initiatives, I really recommend creating and compiling design system PRD documents. So they're product requirement documents. So they're usually used within the product teams. But I found those to be really beneficial to help build the story of what you're working on. And you can then use that to communicate with the different audiences. I also think don't over communicate. So you've got to constantly over communicate everything. So don't assume that, don't assume anything ever. <laughs> don't assume that 
that just even the person that you think knows the design system inside out, they've got your back. Just don't assume anything like that. Just always over communicate and you can never communicate too much. Yeah, they might get sick of you, but at least they'll know what you're working on. I think at least they know the direction that you go in and what the team are focused on. And, and don't pretend that everything is fine. Sometimes it's, it's not fine. You know, sometimes it is a little bit stressful. You know, sometimes we don't have the velocity, we don't have the scope and there are risks and you don't need to be all drama rama about it. You know, you can be kind of clear in the communications about, you know, the, the potential risks, but you just need to be explicit and communicate, communicate it clearly. So uh, my previous boss, Gwen, she would always encourage me to firstly communicate the problem, explain why it's a problem, explain the potential impact, and then offer a proposed ideal solution. And that, for me, is one of the most valuable pieces of advice. I mean, she gave me many <laughs> valuable pieces of advice, but that was one that made my job and her job so much easier because she understood the risks and she understood what I needed from her. And it made she made... <clears throat> And I made it clear what would happen and what to expect if we didn't resolve that, that issue. So we've kind of all cards on the table, so to speak. So as an example, this is how I like to that note with kind of Gwen's teaching is how I might visualize and communicate to senior stakeholders the potential impact, let's say. Not that I would always <laughs> throw up like a ready-made deck, but you know, just sort of visual examples. But let's say we had lack of engineering support. What I'm saying here is I'm not saying that we can't work without engineering. I'm just being pragmatic. And I'm being clear that if we were to work in the model that we're working at the moment, you know, we were working with ad hoc engineering capacity, then yeah, we'll get the stuff done, but naturally it's going to take a lot longer. So we will get there eventually. All the cards are on the table, but then at least everyone knows where we're at and what to expect. So there's no surprises from anyone. And that just helps then to communicate and you can have then those tough conversations of potential, well, not tough conversations, that's probably the wrong turn of phrase, but you can have those conversations of understanding yeah, impact and where you're at and kind of what, how things will roll out. So going back to the planning calendar that I showed you before, here's how you could start to break it up with your initiatives through quarters based on the hypotheses that you start to create with the canvas. So the canvases, you could start to do those in the gray planning phases. And then you might then have kind of start accounting for more like discovery phases. So in a similar way to how you would do it with a customer product. But the key is to account for those clear differences of when you want to do the research, when you're going to start doing the planning, you know, so you can start to have more consistent, regular conversations. You can communicate things clearly. And yeah, as mentioned before, there's no kind of nasty surprises for anybody, let's say. So to quickly conclude with yet another trio of statements, um, research is fundamental. In my head, I sounded like RuPaul when I said that. <laughs> I don't know, I don't think I actually did though, did I? Of course I didn't. Um, anyway, <laughs> don't forget about your research. Uh, <laughs> I'm flustered and I'm nearly at the end. Um, don't forget about your users. Connect with them, work with them, speak with them. You know, speak the language of the business, know your audience and know how to cater the information for them. So what motivates the CPO is going to be different to what motivates the kind of design team or a product designer. And what motivates a CTO is going to be different to what will motivate somebody on the delivery side of things. So have all the information gathered and then know how to kind of cater it for your audience. And then balance risks and resources. So take calculated risks, but stay focused on the reality of what is within scope and, and kind of what is within the scope and your reach within the organization. Sometimes that reality might feel a little bit frustrating if you want to get to places faster. But if you have the conversation, start planning, 
again, it just starts to feel a little bit easier and starts to feel less like a steep uphill battle and more of a kind of slower, <laughs> more gradual incline. Uh, and with that, thanks for listening and thanks for having me here today. Hopefully you're all still awake. <laughs> um, you can find me here on the links here. Um, and if you subscribe to my Substack, um, I'll send you a notification when I've got all the resources that I've shared today available later in the week. So um, I'll share the, the canvas and a PRD template and some various kind of other kind of fun stuff, if you think it's fun <laughs> like that. <laughs> but yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. You did amazing. I nobody here believes that that was your first talk as well. We're all also always welcoming first time speakers. But yeah, thank you so much, Marian. Um, we I'm sure everyone here might have questions. Perhaps everyone that is in the audience here can take the time that we're networking after to come up to Marianne and ask the questions. So we'll take maybe a few questions from the folks online, if that's okay. Um, so cool. Can I have a safe word? <laughs> <I'm Jelly course. laughs> um, we'll, we'll go easy on you. <laughs> Um, so I have a question here from your experience. Uh, I think you spoke there about the maintenance phase, right? Um, from your experience, what traps should you, should be avoided when maintaining a design system to prevent unnecessary stress and frustration? I think, I guess maintaining things, you don't want to sort of fall into, this is going to sound a little bit kind of brutal, but you don't want to fall into almost like a kind of that support kind of reactive team, almost like becoming glorified librarians. You want to be able to sort of, even if you're at that maintenance level, you should still have the space and feel that you've got the autonomy to improve things and keep it constantly evolving. I think if you reach the maintenance bit, but you're just maintaining the same ways of working, the same library elements, you know, everything's staying consistent, then you're going to kind of stagnate. It's going to kind of plateau. I think you still need to have that goal and drive and gather in the feedback loops to see where you can still make some meaningful change. Yeah, definitely. Um, and avoid the grey hairs. And avoid the grey hairs, yeah. <laughs> uh, cool. Thank you so much. And there is a question here around any advice. So a lot of, lots of people looking for advice. Um, you shared a lot of practical information there, which was amazing as well. But this is advice on getting buy-in from executives or PMs that see design systems um, slowing them down, so slowing product teams down. I think it's similar. It's similar to to what was what was mentioned before with, with Christoph Start is that I think finding with the kind of more tricky buy-ins, I think it is it does come back down to the way that you communicate. Find out what it is that motivates that person particularly. Because it might not be I'm gonna sound quite always assume that everyone's got the best intentions. You know, I don't think people are just out to get you or out to get the design system. It's because they don't probably don't understand it. They don't see how that impacts them specifically so you need to start to you need to get down at their level and understand or get up at their level and just understand what it is that motivates them you know and what it is that that can help solidify that buy-in a little bit more and I think that's when it would start to feel a little bit easier and it's not like a magic bullet it won't happen overnight I think being persistent with it and having a lot of thick skin and resilience I think is, is kind of essential as well because you will keep getting pushed back and you will have you might have some tricky customers for quite a long time you know but eventually you know you just need to sort of keep going with it really yeah definitely continue continuous education it's never, it's never done yeah cool yeah. thank you so much um I think that's all the time we had for questions thanks again everyone give up give it up to Marianne thanks <laughs>
I think we're wrapping up here. So before we say goodbye, I just want to say thanks to everyone that joined online and a big thanks to our helpers. So we have a few people helping us keep an eye on the chat and Miro. So a big thanks to our helpers. Um, any final words? Yes. So yes. <laughs> as soon as you, technology will always. <laughs> yeah. Um, so thank you everyone for joining us. Maybe we can bring up the Miro board once again. <laughs> Just need to technical issues. No, no rush. We don't, we're not looking forward to that pizza at all. Now I'm sharing my screen. Wow, thank you so much for joining us. And thanks everyone for uh, online, in the online stream for joining us. Look at how many people like, uh, joined us here in the mural board that's really really cool we uh, hope to see you all at um, our conference and i would also love to take this chance to say quickly goodbye super fast with our with our friend here Sander. you want to come and say goodbye together <laughs> <laughs> you probably know him how many followers do you have on instagram like two millions or something <laughs> uh, it's one million <laughs> No, no, nearly. Almost. Nearly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's your yeah, I just want to say uh, hello and goodbye with, uh, with Sander oh. because I'm a big fan. So yeah, yeah, thank you so much, everyone, <laughs> for oh, joining yeah, us. Oh. <laughs> and this is the moment you've been waiting for. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, pizza can be a bit cold, but like it's ready there's like vegan pizza non-vegan pizza all the stuff is there help yourself some drinks are there as well we have some some sort of plates and napkins and you know go for it thank you Hello, everybody. This is Petra, your online host. I hope you had a wonderful time in this event. Um, I hope you really learned a lot. So did I, at least. The both talks were just amazing, mind-blowing. I still have to re-watch it, I think, to get all the information in my head. <laughs> um, there's still a lot of open questions on the Miro board. Usually our speakers take the time to answer them. So if you still have questions, feel free to drop them. Don't drop them in the chat, drop them on the Miro board. There the speakers can have a look later or somebody else can answer it later. Voila. Sam, Thanks did so you enjoy much. it as well? Oh, it was so good. I, uh, I like like you, I can't wait to go back and, and watch it when I'm not distracted by all the really funny banter in the chat. I just want to say thank you for everyone who keeps it interesting to hang out online. I think we've all been to those events where you're just like, oh, what am I watching this for? So thank you for being a part of the event. You were not speaking, but you made it enjoyable for everyone else. So thank you for your participation and your presence, everyone in the chat. Um, I will post the links one more time in the chat. I suggest you try and save them if you can. You'll have access to that Miro board forever. Uh, they never really go away. So you can go back and revisit them later, which is so awesome. And uh, we would really love to see you at the conference. If you are able and willing to attend, we all want to see you. Uh, I'm hosting some of the talks. I'm also giving a presentation with Romina, who was in the chat about how to name tokens. So, and if you take a look at the website, all of the speakers are on there. There's a lot of really great talks coming up. It's well worth your time. Um, so again, thank you very much to everybody. And uh, we'll see you around on the socials. We will. Have a great evening, everybody. Bye for now. Bye-bye. <laughs>